getting the stuff ready here. Oh, oh, I to share we're gonna, my audio. Don't worry about music yet. Well, you, actually, you can if you want. I want to, uh, I'm just getting the. That sounds okay. It's, it shouldn't be on yet. Like talk amongst ourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. Like, if it comes in mid conversation, you can just be like, oh, hey, hey, there you are. Hey, we're, we're terribly professional here. <laughs> I would never make it as professional. Like, professional? <laughs> yeah, like this black. And we're just, I think we're just about to uh, get going here. We're like a laser. Uh, we're getting close. We may have to start the music again. I don't know why, but Facebook is slow, slow, slow at this point. It does the same thing when we do Facebook Live. Yeah, Facebook Live just has this lag, which is really annoying. I look forward to some kind of multi platformness and be like, we've got Instagram and happening all together. Yeah, that would be awesome. Almost there. Wow, I can't believe how slow this is. This is just silly. I could read a book. I am reading a book, actually. You've gotten to a dial-up. I know, this is like, we've gone back to 14.4. Bots. And here we go. We should be. Hasn't been yet. It. I think yet that it's live. Anybody see it? I see it. It All does right. it. Give you a little, a little fade. Like an almost professional. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being uh, viewers of this wonderful show. One more time, we go through the, the madness that is known as the Hell Bent for Horror Takeover, the Women in Horror Film Festival page. I am S.A. Bradley. I'm the host of Hell Bent for Horror. Uh, and uh, my co host is Vanessa Wright, and she is the co founder of the Women in Horror Film Festival. Today, we have two great guests. We have director Nathan Ludwig, and we have director Reagan Kelly. Uh, marketing director of uh, Genre Blast Film Festival. Hi, guys. Hello. Hey. How's it going? Good to be here. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I, of course, we want to talk about uh, Genre Blast. So who wants to start the conversation about where you guys are, what you're doing, and what you're doing right now under this crazy stuff that's happening? Um, that right? Sure. Um, so we are, we've already announced we are having a, a live festival this year. Um, we weren't sure what we were going to do up until literally when we announced it, we decided the day before that that's what we were going to do. Um, so we will be at the Alamo as long as they're open, um, as long as the government doesn't step it back and close theaters down again, because they were closed for about 90 days. So, yeah. Um, so honestly, financially, they need us to be there and, you know, we hope we can still be there and, everything going as it is in Virginia, we should be fine because we've been pretty stable. Um, so far so, so good in Virginia, yeah. So far so good, I mean, as good as, you know. As good as a pandemic can be. I guess we can expect it to be. Well, but, uh, I look at it this way. If it's safe enough that restaurants can be open and people are actually going, I don't think there should be a problem then to just be going to the theater if the theater is open. Right. If you are maintaining social distancing, if you are you know, being responsible and doing what you're supposed to do, then, you know, but I'm, I'm assuming, you know, like anything else, there's going to be people that are, you know, well, I think there's also, there's also bad precedent, right? I mean, if you mm -hmm. take a look at some of the conventions that opened up and decided they were going to go right. hell or high water, Days of the Dead did nobody any favors. Uh, everything that I've True. heard from what happened with Days of the Dead, they, they did it poorly. They did it with a level of arrogance. And even worse, they bad-mouthed the celebrities that said, no, I'm not going to show. Oh, wow. And they did and that last second. 
that's just the wrong way to go. I mean, we, and we've said like, if you don't want to come and you're not comfortable, there's absolutely no pressure. Um, we don't expect. And them. you guys are limiting the amount of tickets sold and the amount of people that will even be in there, which I absolutely. think is another. We'll be yeah. half. We have the largest theater at the Alamo and we're only allowed to sell half of the seats. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in budgeting for people that are coming together, um, there would be two seats in between. Right. Um, now with Alamo, if I remember correctly, they have like the seating tables, right? So you already mm -hmm. have a distancing between them, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you already, you're already a couple feet further than a normal theater than you are from the row in front of you or behind you. Right. Right. Um, and then you plop two seats in between and then um, you have to wear a mask the entire time. We've been telling people we're going to be super, super serious about it. So if you're not wanting to wear a mask, don't come because not only are we going to have to keep reminding you that Alamo can lose their their right to be open. They can get shut down if they get reported right. for people not wearing masks. So we have to be super vigilant about it. And it's a really, really know. tough situation that you guys are in. Everybody is in, right? Mm -hmm. Especially the arts. I just signed a petition here in the Bay Area to try and save six of the historic theaters. Theaters that never had any problems. They are historic for reasons. And uh, San Francisco loves its history and especially its, uh, its uh, independent theaters. But they're all, hey, we're, we're in six months of nothing as of right now. And so uh, I'm signing petitions to somehow get GoFundMes and things going for many things that were uh, at one point really big. And I think for the most part, the, uh, the arts are so important. And uh, people don't recognize how important it is uh, until something like this happens. So it's really uh, just as necessary for this to continue as it is anything else. Uh, but it is. It's, it, it's, a, it's a tough, tough thing. When you say you're uh, looking at taking all the precautions and stuff, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I know that uh, this is something that is uh, touchy for a lot of people. I live with a microbiologist. Mm -hmm. Believe me. I know how touchy this is. <laughs> well, and there's, there's also like, you know, if anybody's been to any film festival, not just genre blast, but um, you know, the lobby is kind of the congregating point where we've got the step and repeat and the tables and everybody kind of hangs out and has a beer and, but the lobby will be closed this year. So there isn't going to even be that opportunity to, to group and gather. So um, the only tables you're going to actually be able to use are going to be outside. Mm -hmm. um, and we did just get the okay that we can put the step and repeat outside as well as a check-in table, but people are still going to have to wear masks when they're out in front of the theater. Um, yeah. So it's going to be different. I mean, it's really just going to be, it's going to be about the films. I mean, there's not going to be any extra frills right. or anything like that. So, so it's, it's kind of good. Cause I mean, you know, we have a great lineup, so it's just people are going to be there to see the movies. Yeah. Yeah. I think, there's a big social aspect to genre blast. People love to network and hang out and schmooze. And that's unfortunately, that's just not going to be a facet of the festival this year. And we, we know that there's people that aren't going to come no matter what we do. They just, they're going to stay home. They either live far away. They don't want to be out in a pandemic. And that's understandable. We, we understand that. Um, but there are a group of people, you know, people don't want to hear this, but there are a group of people that don't have a problem with going two places as long as they're masked up and they're taking the precautions. And that's the crowd of people that we've attracted this year. And we felt like there was a need for a physical festival um, due to private conversations we've had with some people, some people reaching out to us, asking if we actually are gonna have a festival. We weren't sure if we were gonna even bother to try to do a live festival. We thought everybody was gonna be like, what are you doing? Like, why would you do this? But most of the people that reach out to us uh, were like, uh, are you gonna do genre blast? I'm like, do do you, do you want us to do genre blast? Like, <laughs> really? And, and so we've got almost nearly a full theater right now. So uh, we're really excited about it. Well, and just like we would hope, you know, nobody gets nasty and gross about it. Just like we would never get nasty or gross about anybody going virtual. Oh, right. It's just, it's a personal preference and it's what we decided as opposed to what other people have decided. And we support whatever yeah. everybody chooses. To do, yeah. So. And I think keeping it to, you know, it's, you're not forcing anyone to be there. You know, mm -hmm. it's a hundred percent an adult's decision to decide if they want to attend or not. And if they decide not to, that's fine. You know, I mean, I, I don't, you know what I mean? I mean like I, I, and that's the conversation we had. I was like, if five people show up, 
five people are going to see all these great yeah. films. Yeah. So. Well, it's kind of like I'm, I'm a big fan of the Oakland Zoo. I live near the zoo and, and that's been closed <laughs> for a while. And I was giving fruit to the animals and things that were asking for stuff mm -hmm. like that. And they finally are starting it up again. And the way that they are doing it is by uh, almost like RSVP. You know, so I ended up uh, helping them out by getting a membership uh, and there were membership days and they only allow certain people in a certain amount of people in the zoo and at certain times you have to come at a time. And I'm assuming we'll probably have to leave at a certain time, but I'm going to take my, my, dear sweet time through the zoo and that's yeah. i mean it is a little bit different because outdoors is different than indoors yeah indoors you've got air handlers you've got people who are sedentary they are not moving around so you know there's there there is a little bit more of a of a a risk there but i get that if you take the precautions it seems as if it's uh, it's worthy to try and get something through i know that the zoo uh, which may not have been the most popular uh, attraction in the Bay Area, sold out in seconds. You know, I had uh, like a membership thing. It's like, fuck, giraffes. Let me fucking see a giraffe. I haven't seen a giraffe in I don't know how long. And so, you know, people are, people are hungry for it. I think there is a necessity, but I do think that it's really, really, really important that it is stressed how much you guys do. Because uh, like I watched a video of a, uh, it was the, an actress who went to uh, not days of the dead, but another one that was, I think back East and they showed how much they did to make sure that she never met anybody <laughs> until they came down the row to the table. And uh, they had like half a football field between her tables and they had a back, you know, back doorway, you know, with uh, partitions and things. So it felt very you know, like, Hey, you, outside of not having one, that's about as much as you can do. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think it may seem like belaboring the point, but I want to make sure everybody gets, this is not just you getting a free pass <laughs> on <laughs> things that I usually talk about. Uh, but also uh, I think it helps people who are, man, shit, uh, why are they doing this? Uh, everybody's, uh, trying to go virtual, trying to find a new way. Why are you doing this? That your motives are pure, your reasons are pure, and your intentions uh, of doing the most that you can is really out there. And being able to make that public before you end up going out there and getting roasted by the uh, the, the fucks with no names uh, who decide <laughs> to be the, the, right. the uh, police of everybody. Uh, you at least have an opportunity to state your ca your claim, state your case. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you doing for uh, people who are uh, like press versus people who are the filmmakers versus the guests. Uh, you can take that one, Nate, if you want. Um, as far as what we're doing for like precautions and whatnot? Is, is yeah, that precautions, what uh, keeping them together, separate, you know, some are gonna be there longer, you know, wh whatever it might be, places to sit, places to be alone. <laughs> well, there's definitely gonna be a smaller group this year. It's gonna be easier to kind of, kind of preside over everybody. So, you know, we're talking about a maximum of 75 people. So it's kind of, I want to say exclusive fest because it's not my choice. But, wow. You know, the draft house is open and we're going to be there. We're, we're supporting each other. The Alamo wants us to be there. We want to be there to support them to get, you know, to make them some money. So that, that relationship is important to us. And that of 75 people, there's going to be masks, of course, at all times. The only time you don't have to wear a mask is when you're eating and drinking, obviously, because they have full service at the Alamo draft house in the theater. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be social distancing. Uh, two seat buffer, like Reagan said, in between everybody. It's a 175 seat theater. There's only going to be 75 seats available. So there's going to be plenty of space. As soon as you buy a pass, it automatically builds in a two seat buffer on each side. So there's no, I mean, unless you have a group of people that you came with, you can obviously sit together if you want to. But uh, you're not going to be forced to sit next to somebody that you don't know or you don't trust. Uh, everybody's going to be wearing masks. <laughs> Me walking around going. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be people I think we should not sit by. No. <laughs> yes, right. D, uh, my you. invite is in the mail, right? It's in the mail. But uh, yeah. I, well, I, and another thing, we usually have like a, uh, I, don't know, I hate to call it a VIP lounge because we swore we would never do anything like that. But it's like a green more room. of like a media media lounge, green room kind of thing. So it's it's up in the projection booth and we would take, um, you know, different podcasters and, and media outlets up there. And that's where they could interview people. Um, obviously that's a tight confined space. So we're not going to do in, that. In this a good year. Year, so that we're not doing that either this year. So, um, yeah. mm -hmm. so if people want to interview, much, yeah. it would it's have to be. Yeah. 
or in the theater when no one else is in there. But that's really even limited this year too, because they're going to be cleaning so often that um, right. we really don't even have that. So well, I'm, I'm super intrigued to see how it goes because the, I mean, after talking all of that stuff, the horror fan in me, the cognitive dissonance guy, it's like mm-hmm. going, I want to find out what this looks like. Because this is uh, like I've done hikes through San Francisco. I've gone to my dentist. I, I've done all of these things, the vet, and everything is so different. You have this mm-hmm. strange little extra thing that's there to always remind you. It's almost like when you see movies where somebody's in like a hypnotic dreamland and they have this one thing that's supposed to bring them out, like a pair of dice or whatever. And they see the <laughs> dice, everything starts to, it's kind of like you're in this place and then all of a sudden you're going to go, yeah, we're watching movies about being terrified and we are at a level one terror we're like just sitting. It. Yeah, we're in the soup. Little monsters are all around us going like this, and we've got a mask and uh, hand sanitizer to try and keep us relatively safe where our immune system won't. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's going to be really intriguing to see where uh, you guys go with this, you folks end up going with it. Uh, I wanted to talk about horror and art as so important as of right now, because it's something that I thought of well, last convention I went to was in Tucson, Arizona. And that was a while ago. And uh, we had a wonderful thing of hanging out with the authors and stuff afterwards. It was a more of an author uh, books, book thing. And so I wrote a book and I was there. And one of the people who was there was Jonathan Mayberry. And he's written quite a few interesting books. V Wars was just on Netflix from one of his books. And so he was talking about an apocalypse and he was asking everybody there, who would you have on your team, right? And everybody's going for the police officers, the medics and stuff like that. And he goes, you know what you're all forgetting? The bard, the guitar guy. <laughs> the storyteller. The yeah. storyteller. You guys are going to want to shoot yourself after week three of just being around the military guy. You know, mm-hmm. and looking at the yeah. terrible hard choices. You need to make yourselves legends, and there's got to be someone who can do that. You need to know someone who can tell you the myths that have happened before. You need to have someone who can quote Joseph Campbell when you're ready to just give it in. And it was such a smart thing to say, and such an important and an apt thing to say, that I think that that's why uh, having festivals and art continuing on. With that, my dovetail is to have any of you seen the new Shutter. Uh, exclusive. Uh, oh my goodness! I just uh, blanked on the name. Uh, host, the first movie. Oh, made. Nate saw it. I haven't. Yeah, not I, yet. I watched it last night, and I was really, really happy with it. And the reason I was really happy with it was that it, it really uh, took in all the different types of things that could go wonky in our new world of, of zoom took an old idea you know the the seance and turned that into something that is uh tangled up in technology and what i loved about it is that there's a sense uh, what do we want from horror sometimes what i want is just to be thoroughly surprised and almost like i need to do all the work i don't want everything spoon fed to me so there are three uh, this is a triumvirate of movies that i think were very important to horror and i think this has a possibility of being there as well because it's part of this trio one is blair witch project uh two is uh paranormal activity and then this film because all three of those demand the on- audience to fill in many blanks, to bring the narrative further. And it does not give you any kind of one standard way of telling the narrative. And I think that the, for a 50 minute movie, which I, when I first saw the running time, I was like 56 minutes, you couldn't put 15 more minutes in it to get it. Th- but it, it, it works because there- I didn't realize it was so short. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's the length uh, that you can have an unpaid Zoom account. And that comes uh-huh. into play. Yes, it works and play. It comes into play. And the movie is done very, very cleverly. Um, yeah. Uh, huh. The that whole is conceit clever. is it sets the tone right away. It doesn't waste time with a bunch of stuff that nobody cares about. Yep. It the, the Zoom meeting starts. You, you meet all the characters quickly. You meet the uh, the medium, and that's it. And you're on. You start getting creepy stuff, and it builds to a crescendo. And yeah, it's like at the end of the near the end of the movie, it's like your Zoom meeting is about to expire. And I was like, yeah. oh my God. You yep. guys nailed it. You nailed everything. <laughs> yep. they, they thought of everything. It's a yep. very smart 
a horror film. Well, now yeah. I know what I'm doing when we're done here. Yeah, the bomb yeah. click. It was like the bomb yeah. click. That's what the, the 10-minute warning is so perfect. It goes back to, to uh, Hitchcock's work, you know, start the timer. And so you're already under stress. What I loved was how much we're able to fill in that you don't have to spend time with as a filmmaker telling instead of showing because we're all so used to what it looks like on a Zoom board now. It was almost familiar and it was uh, almost calming to know where the controls would be, what things could mm -hmm. kind of happen. But also you introduce characters very quickly that way. And the care, it was really, the acting was pretty darn good for people who are just kind of sitting down pretending to be friends or they are friends. And Waylon uh, Jordan just said, excellent movie. Yes, all right, Waylon. Well. So, right. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be promoting this one quite a bit. I, I'm sending it to people or links to it to people because uh, I really feel that this is another movie that people are going to, in about three weeks, they're going to talk about how it's been overhyped. They're going to try and push it down like they did uh, <laughs> Paranormal Activity and The Lair Witch Project, which I still think are masterworks They're because both of what they do. Films. Yeah. I would say, I went to a screening of Paranormal Activity, uh, and there was about a, there was a whole group of us, and after the movie was over, half of us thought it was creepy and great, and the other half thought it was one of the dumbest movies they'd ever seen. And that I goes back awesome. to... When people say that about the Blair Witch and others mm -hmm. like um, footage movies where they don't show you a lot, what they really mean to say is a lot n enough was not explained for me. I didn't get to see the monster. I didn't right. get closure uh, at the end of the film. So therefore, I thought it was stupid instead of opening mm. the dialogue and saying, I wish they would have shown the monster more. Why, why didn't we get to see the Blair Witch? And, yeah. and for me, I think, yeah. that, that's I think it's creepier or not. When yeah. You don't get everything explained to you. You know, you know I love both. But I, I'm a big fan of uh, when you don't get to see it, at least uh, minimize how much you get to see it. I love that liminal terror where you have things happening out of the corner of your eye where you almost see something and you don't quite. They had a great liminal moment uh, in this film, which has to do with playing with backgrounds, the mm -hmm. virtual backgrounds. So the idea that I could disappear if I'm too close to the look of my virtual black. That was a very clever moment. I know exactly what the, back, yeah. the background. It was such yeah. a well done moment. Yeah. And as soon as it popped up, you hear that dread feeling. You're like, oh. Yep. No. You remember what was yeah. going on. And they set it all up rather well in the very beginning. I mean, that's the thing. These characters, they don't have to go deep, but you already know personality types. You know who's the joker. Anything. They were just like, yeah. here you go. If you didn't pick up on it, too bad. You yep. know? People showing their items and stuff, and those items are going to come back into play. I was really pleased. I thought that they had, they had a checkbox for everything, and they were knocking it down. You mentioned the idea of what people look at for, for horror, and I do believe that there's people who love the idea of being scared once, and then after that, they like the comfort food of knowing what's coming. And I think that's why like slashers were so big. I mean, they got so templated. Uh, but to a point, I had a friend who was telling me, well, I like them because it's like a nice warm bowl of soup. And I'm like, that's not what horror is supposed to be. <laughs> horror is not supposed to be a nice warm bowl of soup. Mm. Yeah, it's wow. like, wow. Soup. <laughs> I absolutely love when I'm watching a horror movie and I just go, I have no, I have no idea where this is going. Yeah. Like I could guess all day long and have no clue. Like we just watched Vivarium. Has anybody seen it? I haven't seen it yet. Good. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's I, I haven't. It must be really weird. And I watched it about. last night. I wasn't completely sober, so I'm not sure. <laughs> that I can like. I, I haven't decided how I feel about it yet. Okay, fair. That's fair. It's weird as shit. I think I what like I that. like had a hard time with is it. It felt like it was just tipping the iceberg. Mm of the meat of the story and then it just ended and i was like what, what? wait a minute like yeah but sometimes was, there, that can work and i don't i'm depends. not sure yeah. that it works and it's showing, driving not, me crazy <laughs> and yeah i feel like some movies when you you know the last act you start to get some some idea of what's going on then it ends and then it's a slippery slope because sometimes you're like well wait a minute like where did you go come back yeah. Or, but then sometimes you're like, you ended at the right spot. That's good. Right. Now I can figure out what's going on. Right. If I, I feel all level... I need, I need someone else that has seen it to talk to him about it. Because I'm like... Um, Chad saw it by very... to talk, talk to him about it. Oh, I'll text him after we're done yeah. here. Yeah, I feel uh, that a level of frustration is good. As, uh, when I go, that was fucking smart. 
at, as soon as I'm frustrated. I remember growing up in the 70s, and the 70s were the time of the bummer endings. And so you had just about everything ended with a bummer ending. There was this great movie <laughs> called Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, these fun-loving kids that steal a car and the police are after them. It's like before there was Smokey and the Bandit. So think of like Smokey and the Bandit, but it ends in a fiery train collision <laughs> with the car. And that's what happens. They're like, nobody can catch us now. And the car goes over a train track and... <laughs> Hits a train, blows up, and that's it. Your fun-loving kids are dead. And that was something that happened a lot in, in, in the 70s because there were experts at doing that kind of thing. There were people like Coppola who does a conversation, which has this end that just kills you. You could have well, these killer endings, uh, these dark endings. And then everybody was like, well, those are big. I think I can do them. No, you can't. It's like what I call um, Kubrick, uh, Shining-itis. In horror, there's been shining itis since The Shining got big. And The Shining wasn't big when it first came out. But once it was on HBO every other day, it really became this movie that everybody got into and got hypnotized by. But so many people think that they can do hypnotic. Mm -hmm. And God, I've watched so many movies where I'm like, oh, no, oh my God, he thinks he's Kubrick. He thinks <laughs> that holding on this fucking shot is doing something. And, and so I think that there are uh, uh, moments like that where we're going to see movies where they end because they don't want to tell you everything and they're just not adept enough to know what you can let out or omit and what you should tell. And I think sometimes movies do. They just end like, I, I was watching one that, boy, the premise was really cool. It was like this demon that was in this house that would make you forget the loved one in the house that it was killing existed. You just oh. lived as if oh. that person didn't exist. And you didn't know that till the end, like towards the it's end of the movie. Terrible demon. Yeah. And, and so uh, at first mm. I'm like going, this movie really is poorly written. I was like, I don't understand the motive. Why are people acting like they're acting? And it's like, oh, well, you have to watch it again and realize that there's a person in the room that they're not recognizing they're not seeing and that person's going a little bit mad and uh, mm -hmm. great idea, but you needed That's a better cool. execution. Yeah. You needed a better execution. The wretched, that was a Jennifer Trudrung mentioned. Uh, so, so much in that movie was really interesting. And then there was just this thing where it didn't connect completely. And it felt like what you said, Reagan, it was a tip of the iceberg. The yeah. really cool nugget that drew me in was in the last 20 minutes. That was, that was vivarium. It was like, this long sequence of like, and, and the cinematography was cool. Like the set design was very cool. Like it was a cool looking movie. And it's two, two actors pretty much the whole time. Mm. Um, oh, Jesse Eisenberg yes. and um, the British chick. I can't remember Imogene her name. Boots. Was that, was yeah. that who was in it? Yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah. And, um, and they were really good. It's just, they got to like the really like needy part of the story in like the last like mm. very end and i'm like oh, yeah this is where i was like getting into it and i want to see more but, storytelling's mm -hmm. hard <laughs> it was tough it was a tough one i will say uh, i'm gonna need somebody favorite, to watch it and get back to me one of my favorite directors is a japanese director named kiyoshi kurosawa and i think he's almost on the level of kubrick as far as holding shots mm -hmm. and building tension um, he's done movies like Cure and Pulse, which I think are yes. classic horror films. Mm -hmm. yes. And yes. just the level of dread that he can build in, in static shots and long takes, I think almost rivals Kubrick as far as I'm concerned. So if anybody think, hasn't seen Pulse or yes. Cure, go watch those movies. They're two of the best horror movies ever. Yeah. The, um, the Pang Brothers version of The Eye is really great as well. Uh, it's a, yeah. it's not as much yeah, I, very creepy yes yeah but they, they're so good at, I, I it's hard to get me with a, a good jump cut but they got me with a couple because they kind of know the secret of the jump cut which is bring the sound in first oh Have the sound the in that movie is dread inducing yeah it scared the shit out of me yeah like the scene in the elevator oh yes was, you know, Talk about elongating time. You're sitting there looking up at the, the numbers changing and you think it's up at like floor seven. It's like four. And you're going, oh my God, you know, like the fourth floor is a nightmare. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I, I love that stuff. And I just wanted to say uh, hello to Jennifer Trudrung, uh, writer, director, actor. Fantastic. Uh, also, Waylon Jordan, uh, Adriano Engaro from Germany. Uh, and I see Carrie Yates is from the UK. Wonderful. Great <laughs> to see all you folks hanging in there. Rick Sarah, our, our rock. <laughs> Rick Sarah, the rock. He's here every time. 
And, I honestly uh, keep forgetting that other people are watching this right now. <laughs> well, that's the, yes. that's the magic of our show, right? <laughs> the fun part. The stunningly <laughs> unprofessional part of us. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing I didn't ask that I always ask on my show, and I'll ask you both, uh, what was your first kiss? What was the movie that sent you down this terrible path and getting hooked on horror and, and continuing to make that part of your life? Reagan, you want to go first? Oh, my God. My answer is so basic. Uh, Halloween is like my gateway drug. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. I hear that How so rare. You? How old was I? Oh my gosh. I'm sure Nate showed it to me because he's my older brother. If nobody else knows that. It's um, his fault. <laughs> I was probably like 12, 11, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he used to torture me with it. Um, <laughs> when my parents Classic. would leave us alone to go out and yeah he'd leave Classic it on older in the brother room and then like leave but uh yeah. but yeah definitely halloween was like my my gateway drug for sure i'd have to say for me i mean when i was a kid i, I mostly watched just you know the basics like any any 80s kid it was back to the future and gremlins and star wars and the karate kid and all the good stuff i don't really remember I don't know if it, it might have been Candyman. I was pretty late to the party when it came to horror movies, maybe probably the mid-90s is when I started to really, maybe right around high school is when I started to really get into horror movies. I'd say probably Candyman affected me pretty good. When I saw that, it, it genuinely terrified me, but at the same time, I was like, I got to see more of this. Like, I got yeah. <laughs> to see where, I'm pretty we, sure where, we where both else can I get this, you know? So I think it was probably Candyman. That movie was spooky. I remember seeing that in the theater and I think everybody had the same experience, but when she is in the parking garage and he says, Helen, like, oh, you feel it. And it's just like, what's going to happen? That, the score for that movie is so oh. underappreciated by Philip. So, yes. yes. That is up it there. It is with brilliant. Like Amityville yeah. uh, and Exorcist as far as like, just I can, I'm listening to it in my head right now and it's just yeah. creeps the hell out of me so well done mm -hmm. sometimes movies somehow capture the the thing that happens in my head you know so that is a movie that helen is the kind of thing that when i was growing up and i grew up in a fundamentalist house that believed that demons were everywhere and every little sin was a chance to be possessed and all so, of that so it was frailty basically it was exactly. I'll tell you my my frailty story once I'm done with this because it, I I had a, a like a fugue state while watching that movie. It was really crazy. So yeah, I was with this freaking family that had all this stuff that demons were real, and so there was this whole thing of how people would say, yeah, uh, somebody had a Ouija board in the closet, and they'd walk past and they'd just hear Dorothy, and they'd be like, and so it was this whole idea of broad daylight banality. And then there's this evil thing just fucking with you. And so that whole thing of she's still in daylight, even though she's in a parking garage and that hell and just kind of, he's not saying it in an evil way. It's all contextual. And uh, that was a sound that was in my head. Another one was uh, the movie, The Entity with Barbara Hershey. Oh yeah. The sound of her being attacked. That, that was the sound of me right before I was going to get beaten up when I was trying to run home from school and somebody was trying to beat me up. And it was like, that was the sound. So when I saw it in the theater, I kind of went a little numb. I was like, how did they get that sound? How did, how did that happen? How did somebody get to replicate that? I met wow. someone else who was in a cult when I went to see Frailty in the theater. And I always wished I could have met Bill Paxton and tell him how important that movie was as what horror is supposed to do, which is help me relieve my shadow, help me have a handshake yeah. with that darkness. And uh, we walked out of that movie and most people are indifferent, but on either side of the theater, me and another guy are just like standing there holding our sides. <sighs> like we just ran really far and I looked over, saw each other and just kind of ran right to each other and said, I have to ask you, I already know what you're going to ask me. Yes. And it was like, <laughs> holy shit. And we just sat there for a half an hour, two complete strangers talking about the power that that movie had because it released so much tension. One of the things that was so realistic about that movie is thinking that your dad's not crazy. In broad daylight, your dad says something crazy. And then you're in school and you can't keep your eyes open. Mm -hmm. That was the terror, the shock. Uh, when I was in this thing as a kid and my world was falling apart around me, I was just having a hard time keeping my head up. I was so tired. And that was how the stress took it on me. And I said, wow, 
they hit a home run with this film. And I, I thought moralistically the movie was really smart and it was a nice tight film. And I love that it was weird, you know, a bowling trophy turning into the angel of mercy or whatever. <laughs> I love it. It's crazy. One of the best cast in a horror movie too. Just, I mean, Bill Paxton, mm -hmm. Matthew McConaughey and Powers Booth in the same movie. Oh my God. Yeah. It doesn't get any better than that. No. It's, it's pretty hard. I'm trying to think of some that I, I might say. But yeah, that's one of the high ones. Uh, yeah, you were about to say something, Vanessa? You have questions? I, I was, well, I don't have a question, but uh, we have some people chiming in with some of uh, films that have affected uh, them or, or their first kiss, if you will. Um, uh, we have uh, Holly Mollahan said Children of the Corn. She was mm -hmm. about five. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, that's pretty spooky. Wow. Um, Troy Escamil, I remember this. He and I bonded over the fact that both of ours was poltergeist. Um, and uh, let's see. I apologize because I have scrolled. Uh, Dustin Hamill, the uh, Night of the Living Dead, the original. Oh yes. Um, yeah, it's it's funny, you know, and you probably get this because this is your your go to icebreaker, right? Um, and I've just noticed in the twelve of these that we've done, there's a lot of, I think, I, I don't know if it's generational or not, but there's, there's like these, these top three or four films that were all like, yep, that was mine too. <laughs> you know, and it kind of, it, it seems to be that we all, yeah. we must have hit it around the same time. I, I always think that there are arbiters, uh, there are gatekeepers, whether we like them or not, that happen. And sometimes they're not human. Home box office was a gatekeeper for an entire generation. So we, uh, yeah. just like Fangoria was a gateway, uh, that we basically got our opinions about a bunch of movies from about five guys who were really good writers, who are super fans. And even if you look at the 70s films, I always say that that's three film schools, three classes of guys that knew each other, that basically came up with the golden age of cinema of the, of the 70s. It was USC, UCLA, and NYU. And all the big directors knew each other, lived with each other in Malibu, all of that stuff. And that becomes the language of art. And I think that happened in the 20s in Paris. Uh, it happens a lot. But we have a digital version of that as well, which was the, the, uh, the video store. But I think HBO is the really interesting, insidious film school that people don't talk about because yeah. I, I believe that some movies play better. I think The Thing was revived because it was on uh, uh, HBO a lot. And so people got mm -hmm. to see it. They didn't see it like I did. I saw it first day with my dad next to me, which is like watching porn with your dad. My dad was so <laughs> furious because that was his favorite movie from the 70s or from the 50s. And this was yeah. like, uh, this was like a rape of it. He was so angry. And, uh, and so there were a lot of us that were almost forbade to see it. And so many that didn't see it in the theater, that, that sense of how small that movie really is. If you take it apart, uh, scene by scene, it's not a big film. It's a lot mm -hmm. of drawing room stuff. It works so good on TV because you're isolated already. It's smaller. Whereas some movies that play much bigger, I'm not necessarily sure work all the time in that. But uh, my first one was an HBO thing too, but it's a little bit different. Mine was uh, Don't Look Now. <laughs> I was eight years old and I saw that drowning sequence and lost my fucking mind for like three nights. Uh, but it made me a horror fan for the rest of my life, albeit a weird one because I always thought that uh, you could be a little weird and esoteric and nonlinear because uh, the first movie I saw was kind of like that. Oh, Christopher yeah. G. Moore says, Fangoria cable movie channels like HBO Cinemax and video stores help to inform my love of horror movies and filmmaking. Yeah, and I, and I said, I did an article on, or a, a podcast on Fangoria when it closed down the first time. And one of the things that I mentioned was that because of guys like Bob Martin, the late rest in peace, Bob Martin, who just died a couple of days ago. Um, we learned to like things like Dark Shadows. Would we have loved Dark Shadows if it wasn't that he was a huge Dark Shadows fan and he was a huge wrestling fan. So we had the Mexican wrestling horror stuff that was in there. There were so many really weird choices in the early, say, 20 to 30 issues of Fangoria that were not the normal thing. But they became normal because that was our only outlet. We had nowhere else to go. That was the place that we all hung out. And we, we got 
we kind of learned through someone else. It was almost like cultural gene splicing. I got my art and craft from, from other folks. And that's why I love when people say Halloween because Halloween was like this benchmark of, Oh, it can be more than just goofy. It, it, it can mm-hmm. be stylish and still only be made for 30 cents. And I think uh, that well, brought a whole bunch of people in. I think going back to, to the cable and not, not necessarily just like the premium paid cable channels but you know i mean cable i'm trying to even remember uh when it really hit and it wasn't a ton of channels that you got um but it gave us access i mean if you talk to majority of people and and reagan and nathan you guys might speak to this a little bit as well but we all were probably watching these movies way before we were old enough you know and you know the movie theater is not going to let you in i think the first R-rated movie I saw actually was Shocker, and I was 13, and I snuck in, um, because I was like, I gotta see a horror movie, you know, and if, if your parents, they just weren't paying as much attention, I mean, if you were in the house, you were safe, it was like, eh, fine, well, guess what, you turn on the TV, nobody's checking your ID, similar to the video store, unless you went to the mom and pop places, Blockbuster's gonna check if you're rating, you know, getting an (laughs) R-rated movie, (laughs) And you're well, not we, out, we had a we had the aunt, the cool aunt that didn't have her own kids. That we <laughs> right. would go over there and she would just let us literally watch what that's where I saw Candyman for the first time. I'm sure that's yeah. where Nate saw it too. Oh, but she, uh, had, she had a VHS collection to die for. It was nothing. She had like everything. West Craven movies and Chuck Norris movies. And oh, uh, just like all the good the shit chair. when you're a kid, you look at nice. it. I'm watching every single one of these movies right now. And uh, yeah, we would go over there and try to borrow. VHS tapes. My mom did not let us watch anything r- r- remotely racy or mm-hmm. The Simpsons. We wouldn't even were even allowed to watch The Simpsons. We couldn't go to rated R movies. Uh, my dad didn't care, but he wasn't at home. He was working. So my mom is the yeah. one that was watching our watching habits because I remember ninety five when Seven came out. I still hadn't been to an R rated movie, and this was like the day of my grandfather's funeral. My cousin, my older cousin, who's a nut job, <laughs> he. Uh, <laughs> he took me to go see Seven right after we buried my grandfather. And uh, oh, he's like, you uh-huh. see a rated R movie. Let's go. And my mind was fucking blown. I was like, I, this first time it I was ever a saw rough an, night. an unedited, you know, like not on TV, R rated R movie. Yeah. Was like, Have you ever seen an R rated movie? Have you ever seen a grown man naked? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, talk about a movie. Like you could probably watch Friday the 13th, like uh, any of the sequels at that age. And it's going to bounce off you easier than seven because seven is Mm. a a dread induced thing with adults being very tense. And as Mm -hmm. a kid, adults being like upset and tense uh, really can get to you. But that's uh, what is so effective about uh, seven is it's a entire movie made up of the USS Indianapolis speech from Jaws. Mm-hmm. You don't see anything. It is you don't seven. See, you see the after effect. Yeah. yeah. You see yeah. the after effect and you hear the story. And when so I, when I saw that movie the first time, I could have sworn I saw Gwyneth Paltrow's head in the box, but you've yeah. never actually never seen actually it. Seen. Mm-hmm. Nope. But nope. it's so remember, strongly suggested that I'm like, yeah, her head was definitely in that movie. Like I saw and, it. It's not. Yeah. Everybody's leaning up to see if they can somehow see over yeah. the frame, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the, and, um, uh, I remember the scene for gluttony. Oh, yeah. That is, for whatever reason, out of the, the entire movie, that stuck with me till today. Like, I still well, can, like, did, picture everything in that scene yes, just vividly. They did a great job, I think, of tapping into that kind of ability to get on that visceral level because I swear I can smell mm-hmm. some of those scenes. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was <laughs> right. so... Like, remember, as they walked in and all the, the car trees were yep. hanging. Like, I was like, yeah. And I then, like, you feel it. like you're in, the, like, this dirt Yes, dirt. It, yeah. was, it was a grimy, Ugh. grimy. It was oh, so no. good. I um, smelled the ammonia in the bucket. A, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we yeah. have a question. It says, um, this is from Dustin Hamill. So with the generational gap and everything at your fingertips now and days, uh, how do you guys and ladies feel about the way the horror genre has progressed? I think it's become more mainstream somehow. I feel like it's like cool to like horror now. Like when we were kids, it was like, Ooh, you're weird. And yeah. now it's like, it's, it's cool to go to horror movies. Like we could tell just from that, um, 
the Alamo when um, we were there when it came out, the remake, chapter one came out. And how many like, you know, cool looking teenagers were coming to see it. And it was like their big thing that they were all doing. And I'm like, when we were kids, you would never have seen like all the popular kids like right. flooding into the theater to see a horror movie. It just so wasn't. Stranger right. Things got very right. Stranger Things looks like the 80s that I knew. We were still wearing Keds. We were shopping at Kmart. Our hair was not well styled. You know, mm-hmm. it, that was that was the heroic. So, I, yeah, I hear you on that. How about you, Nathan? You know that horror has arrived mainstream when there's all these articles on elevated horror and yeah. psychological thrillers and all that bullshit. It's a horror movie. Yeah. If you can't say horror, you're an <laughs> asshole. That's yeah. Everybody wants to say thriller for some yeah. reason. Oh, yeah. boy. I there is a thriller on. category, but people like to lump create this psychological thriller. It's a horror film. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just right. horror film. It doesn't Why make you weird. Doing that? It's all right. a- make you weird. The Sound of the Lambs is a horror movie. Mm-hmm. Seven is a horror movie. Yes, like, of you course. You can call it a thriller if you want, but psychological thriller, mm-hmm. just don't, I don't get like this whole trying to distance you. Like elevated horror is the latest thing. Now. Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> What does that mean? It's a horror film. It's like, like saying why, why it? elitist without actually saying elitist. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm too good to write a horror film. So. Oh, can everybody hear me? It sounds like we're having a bad internet connection. Are you guys okay? Uh-oh. I, oh. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we heard you. I, I, and then I just <laughs> thought he was really into what you were saying. I thought so too. <laughs> Yeah, it moved. Yeah, you you, you yeah. captured them. I'm, I'm here now. Okay, because uh, it was oh. so weird. I'm, I, I was listening to uh, to Nathan, and all of a sudden, it was like a digitized version of dueling banjos. But <laughs> it was like I'm like, what the heck? And, and so and I'm just like, wow, he's really engaged. <laughs> I'm all I do that though. It's also a trance that I just fall into. I'm like, yeah, You're I'm such blank. a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just making sure uh, we had a we had a weird something happened earlier. We had like a strange explosion somewhere, uh, probably like a a, a, a power like thing, a transformer. We, yeah, like a transformer. So we lost power, and I was like, oh shit, is everything going to be okay? And so when we started going like that, I'm like, going, uh oh, we just had a a lull, and I'm hoping mm-hmm. that we're all good. But yeah, yeah, I gotta say, Nathan took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the horror definitely has evolved. Um, horror films have definitely evolved, especially when it comes to technology. Times are changing so fast, and technology is evolving exponentially lately. Um, you know, you got Zoom meetings, and w- when you got found footage films and and smartphones, and y- you have to kind of actually be kind of a bit of an engineer just to screenwrite a a horror film these days because you have to know all this tech and uh unless you want to write your movie based in the 80s which is what i've done but you know if you want to get away from that stuff but i, I mean i think it, it definitely evolved a lot and i i welcome it a good horror movie is a good horror movie it doesn't matter what kind of you know whether it's found footage or whether it's a slasher film a good writer is a good writer and a good horror film is a good horror film and i'm interested in seeing whatever the genre wherever the genre takes us yeah, absolutely yeah and telling a story is always going to be the most important thing and have any of you watched it's it's a four and a half hour uh, commitment now but it's now on shutter which is uh in search of darkness it's uh, it. directed by david weiner and it's uh four and a half hours a comprehensive look at the 80s horror film starts in 1980 nice ends at 1989, has people like John Carpenter and uh, Joe Dante discussing the film. And they don't have a lot of uh, uh, like their own personality coming into it. Uh, it is in what movies they decide to pick to talk about. But in a way, it's almost, it's not pure documentary, but it's good documentary because there's no real motive to it outside of letting the people in front of the camera speak and then they give the whole thing its personality but you do get this thing of watching the movies one year at a time and me remembering every one of those years how horror changed over the 80s and how much was actually happening in there and how much of it uh is not um translatable like uh, the uh, entire beginning of poltergeist has to be bizarre to anybody who's like 15 right now why why is the screen white at all why are they playing the national anthem 
what is that right. all about? <laughs> this is a really patriotic town. You know, and that whole idea of how the analog uh, kind of gets lost in this. And you need to be able to keep up. And I think it's also attention spans are different. Uh, one thing I noticed watching Halloween with a live crowd in Chicago a couple of years ago for a reunion it doesn't move that fast when you're in an audience. It moves great when you're with your friends. But when you're with an audience, you're like, wow, this is a little slow. You know, this uh, doesn't have the pace of where films have progressed till now. Doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means that there is a change in the styles. And I, and I distrust horror fans who say that they don't like the new styles because that's what it's about getting onto a new style folks you know we we need to be able to go down that thing and i uh, i think that it's really exciting where we're going i think the idea of dread yeah. being so big is wonderful and, and i think that's probably why the uh found footage is so popular the last couple of years is because you're you're not relying on cgi you're not relying on a lot of like graphic scenes you're just relying on the fear and the the dread factor that your mm -hmm. your actors are literally just putting out there themselves and and people love it and it's been done so well so many times it's been done poorly a lot of times as well but i think you strip all that stuff out and you're you're left with just you know what can your actors do and i think i think that's why that's so popular is that yeah. we're not mm -hmm. it's so wonderfully primal mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. one of my it's least favorite point. things is oh they don't don't make them like they used to. I hate yeah. that because you can go back to the beginning of theatrical cinema. There's good movies that are released every single year from now until mm -hmm. back when it started. So people who say they don't make them like they used to, they're stuck in one period and they don't want to. Mm -hmm. They don't want to expand their horizons or expand the culture. Warm of, soup. Yeah, pretty Warm much. Soup. So you know, I love going back and revisiting old movies just as much as the next person, but I can't wait for what's coming down the pipe. I'm always interested yeah. in this because uh, there's always good stuff I coming up. Surprised. Mm -hmm. yeah. I need to be surprised. Uh, yeah. If it's yeah. not new, it's through. And that's why I love that we're getting so many different diverse voices in there as well. I hope to not quite understand exactly what's going on all the time. I made it through Jalo. You know, everybody sits there and goes, well, I don't understand. I don't come from that lifestyle. Oh, you understood Jalo completely. Yeah, get away from the dream logic thing. Let's talk. So uh, if you made it through Asian cinema, Asian uh, Cat 3 films, uh, you should be able to handle something that's LGBTQ. It's, it's that simple. And what I'm hoping is to see where the points of view just bring us into a different world where I don't necessarily have all the answers just like that. And it doesn't mean that you have to reinvent anything. It's just a different perspective. And so I'm really intrigued to see what happens as the perspectives continue to uh, expand more. I think, uh, you know, it's why I think found footage is so interesting. In a way, it's the exact same thing that you've seen forever, but it's done, it hits on that primal level in, in this strange way. Like when they, Adam Wingard remade The Blair Witch. I couldn't think, that was like remaking Psycho. Because the thing that was the problem with making a remake of Blair Witch Project and making it more cinematic like a regular film, Blair Witch came to release us from that. <laughs> that is exactly what, why Blair Witch worked so well, was that it was unpredictable. We didn't know when the camera pan would end, that something would jump out. We didn't see the buzzed focus that would make us know something's coming from the left. None of that existed. We didn't hear that weird atmospheric music. We didn't see that very convenient lighting that we knew that someone was going to come out of that door. None of that was there for us. Anybody that had a lot of cinema knowledge from just being a horror fan forever, all those things, those tropes went out the window. And nothing broke my heart more than watching the remake and seeing simulated thunder and lightning. And I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, you're doing that to a Blair Witch film. And it's like, that's exactly what they were trying to get away from. And, and so I found that really, really sad. But I think that's where we can have uh, a lot of growth. Take me places that aren't similar. Uh, take me places that sometimes will insult me. Like that idea, I love the idea that you're not sure, Reagan, what you think of that film. Great. I have a several that I'm still chewing on. Uh, I, I mean, I only watched it last night, so I still have time. I'm just, yeah, I'm not quite there on a well, yet. I need to talk it through. I'm, 
I wonder sometimes too, as viewers, if we've gotten a little jaded in that we have so much at our fingertips at any given time, whereas, you know, I mean, back in the day, if you will, like, you had to wait until it came out into the theater. You know, right. you had to wait till it was available at the video store, until it came here. So there was this natural buildup and anticipation of this desire to see a certain movie, whereas now it's just like, I mean, we can watch thousands of films at any given moment during the day. I sometimes wonder if we've just gotten to like, it's, it's instant like gratification. Almost, um, yeah, every- and it's just like, no, 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 eh, you didn't get me there yet, no. <laughs> like, if if we almost need that that sense of, uh, you know, <laughs> suspense to no, see the film. <laughs> I agree, I totally agree. There's something mm-hmm. to be said for back in the day, you know, in the 80s and even part of the 90s where you stumble upon a movie and you don't know anything about it. You know, if yeah. it's not in the TV guide or it's not in Leonard Maltin's book, you don't know anything right. about it. And then you watch it and you're like, holy shit, I just found a new favorite movie. I got to tell people about it. There was no internet back then. So you had to tell your friends. And, you know, every right. now and then, you know, I remember when I went to, I went to basic training in the army, you know, still, you know, there was the internet, but it still was basically, you know, there was not right. the level of this now, you know, this was like the late nineties. And it was like, you would meet somebody that had that encyclopedic knowledge of movies like you did. And you were like, Oh my God, like I have to talk to you for four hours. Like have <laughs> yeah. you seen this, 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 and this. And you know, nowadays, you know, there's still a little bit of that, but I feel like back then you, a lot of, especially when you're growing up, you had this knowledge and this hunger to want to know about things that happened before you, you know, culture, right. and movies and actors and comedians and, you wanted to know about that stuff, like I Love Lucy or whatever, or Milton Berle or Johnny Carson or, or older films, you were interested in that stuff. And I feel like nowadays, maybe not always is the case, but nowadays, if it's not like instantly available to you, you just, people just move on and they're not interested in any kind of yeah. context or history for a lot of things. And it, it just, well, and, it, and, and the, the, yeah, the attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. Yeah, and I think especially with horror specifically outside of any other genre, it was almost like it was harder to find, you know, like it, it was almost like a hidden secret, like it wasn't so much in the mainstream. So, you know, if you if you did have a friend that had heard about something or told you about something and you were kind of lucky enough to maybe find it at the video store or see it, it was like, oh, I have this thing that like not everybody knows about that, you know, it, it just, I think <laughs> almost made it more special where it's now i mean <laughs> i will be the first one to say i am the one in the conversation that has not seen the movie but pretty much everyone else has you mentioned <laughs> something and it's going to be like oh yeah yeah i saw that i've seen it five times you know now, now that i have kids i haven't seen anything but before that I <laughs> watched, like, that's like 600 movies a year like it was just insane <laughs> but you know my bestie chad and i we used to just compete to see who could watch more movies in a year and we'd go to film festivals now that i've got two kids you know I'm lucky if I see one movie a month, you know, maybe two. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now we're just, stuff. you just have to be more selective of what you actually decide to watch since you only have like this much time to watch. It. <laughs> right, right. Short film. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For films, exactly. I've or stuff you like, know for sure is going to be good. <laughs> yeah, which I mean, I guess that's a whole other thing now too, and especially, you know, running a fest um short films were not a thing growing up that you would see and consume i mean unless you're watching an anthology like you couldn't just see short films and now it's like i mean there's alter there's there's all these different great platforms and shorts and you know yeah i think the closest thing to to that would have been like tales from the dark side or tales from the crypt would have been like but still packaged together as a feature you could yeah right there oh i saw this great 10 minute movie and it scared the crap out of me oh, a couple of them definitely stuck with me but yeah oh um, yeah there was nowhere else to get it i don't know where else you would have found anything like that whether it's in the theater or at blockbuster that was it so yeah mm-hmm. short films weren't even a thing for me you know you know sometimes right. you'd rent a movie at blockbuster or your local mom and pop store and it would have a short film in front of me You're like what the fuck is this yeah. like what is a short film, film? <laughs> Right. What did, what did they like, make is a, it a trailer? I don't get it. <laughs> is this a silent film? They were yeah. all silent, a cartoon. Yeah. Right? It's a real movie. What are you doing with me here? So, 
I have a new appreciation for yeah. I think that's when I started going to film festivals. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I love it. I can't get enough of short films. Sometimes I prefer new feature films just because a good one can get to the point in, you know, you know, three fourths of the time. And, and I love that. And you can get really yeah. weird in short films. You can really go to some crazy places that a lot of feature films won't dare to do. Um, and I think you, you don't even really need a plot for a short film. As long as you can get in, make a statement, have a killer ending, and then get out. That's yeah. a that short film right there. And I, I, I really love that about being able to program mm -hmm. short films for drama class. And some people are so good at it. Yes. Being able to just give you a little snippet. And, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hey, can That's everybody hear us. me? I'm having yeah. I'm having really terrible uh, connection issues. I'm hoping we haven't lost everybody out there. This almost feels like we should have a part two. Uh, I, I'm I'm feeling like this is this uh, well, connection is going to fail on me, and I don't want to lose everybody. But the, I'm I yeah. don't know about you guys, but I'm having a hell of a good time. Yeah, it looks like I would definitely vote so for a part two. Um, Scott is in charge of. I mean, this is it, yeah. he's broadcasting. So I mean, if it if it, if he goes. That's it'll you crash. No as soon as, yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'm worried. It's not like, uh, you know, if I leave, you all go away. And I don't want to have that happen. So I'm letting everybody <laughs> out there know that we're, avoid. we're having some weird issues with our power around here today, which is, you know, the wonders of uh, and joys of live goofiness. Yeah. But, but this is uh, a great deal of fun. What we can do is maybe talk after this uh, about what might be a good time to do it again. I mean, next week yeah. we've got uh, someone already scheduled, so I don't want to uh, impose on that. But maybe we can have uh, an after hours tomorrow or something, a Friday night nastiness. Uh, what we can talk about it. Either way, let yeah. me stop being a wet blanket. Let's see if we can get a little bit more out of this. But uh, <laughs> in, in case we decide to crash, uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, that we were we were covered on that. Um, yeah, uh, talking about uh, how we get uh, got our stuff. I uh, I was a, a kid that the library was the most important thing. So uh, Danny Peary's books and stuff like that came a little bit later, but early movie books that would occasionally have little snippets about horror movies. Uh, those were the places that I found so much. And I found PBS gave me things. You know, there were uh, mm. uh, the million dollar movie out of New York City. Six o'clock, I think, was when they used to show. Four o'clock, six o'clock, they would show movies. And it was New York. So they could take really crazy chances, right? And so they would show things like The Bell from Hell. And I'd be like, holy cow, almost unedited. There were still a few edits to it. But I learned so much about the language of film but through the European horror films that were being shown on uh, regular TV, uh, WOR TV, Channel 9 out of New York City. And uh, it's funny how there is so much like what you said, Nathan, when you meet one of your own, you can't stop, right? You can't stop talking. And it's like, you just find somebody like that. And I think I wanted to talk about that today too. See, we're running out of, Wait, we have no time. I, but this, I oh. have a, real quick before, um, this is an interesting uh, question because I'd like to hear what everyone says. Uh, Kay Wayne Thornley says, has there ever been a short successfully made into a feature? He has not. Uh, yeah, Lights Out was not was made yes. from, um, into a feature. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a movie called Polaroid that was turned into a feature as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Mostly you'll find... Uh, Evil horror. Dead. Yeah, Evil, Evil Dead. Dead started out as Into the Woods, short That's film. Okay. Whiplash was, was started out as a short film, turned into a feature. So, um, yeah, it definitely happened. Dark Star was a college uh, thesis by John Carpenter, turned into a full-length film. For better yeah, some worse. people will shoot the short film as a proof of concept and then hope that it gets made. You know, people will invest in it for the feature. So that definitely happens for sure. Jennifer Trudrung said, Mama and the Shape of Water. Yes, Mama. Yeah, definitely. I didn't know Shape of Water, um, actually. I know that it was supposed to be the Creature of the Black Lagoon. And then yeah. uh, they took Not it off. horror, but um, Sling Blade was a short film mm -hmm. turned into a feature. Oh, cool. I didn't it's know that. Pretty close to horror in, in my book. <laughs> I would agree. To the, to the conversation, I, I consider the conversation to be a horror film, too. Yes, so do I. Absolutely. 
Uh, I, I, we could go on a long, long conversation about that. Uh, you know, this is the reason I had to write a book. I have all these fucking things. Uh, <laughs> my, my definition of horror is very broad. And I mm-hmm. love talking about how horror, even though it's a redheaded stepchild, so many of its tropes are used to navigate dramas to where they need to go. And uh, so much has been borrowed. I think one of the most borrowed guys is Toby Hooper. So many of the concepts that he had in his first couple films uh, show up as set design and uh, interior decoration and lighting uh, that came from his stuff. And just the whole very idea of um, the, the weird rednecky killer families. I mean, that really, uh, you have that personified in Chainsaw. So there are people who were in horror. And even if you look at the, the, the silent films, many of the silent guys started with horror films. And those things change. I mean, Robert Ween doing um, Cabin of Dr. Caligari, that gave us the entire template for the horror film. I mean, the, the way to use shadow, the way to use light, uh, the, the jump scares in there. Uh, so it's really interesting. Uh, I could go on and on about war films. Certain war films are horror films, certain films aren't. Like I do a whole thing about Platoon and Full Metal Jacket. One's kind of a horror film, although it has satire in it, and the other is just a straight drama. And it's because of intent. It's where, what are you trying to say? And you can even see it on the posters of those movies. There's one that says, the first casualty of war is innocence. And then the other one is born to kill. <laughs> and it's like you, right there you get an idea which one's going to go where and uh, so yeah there's tons of really amazing stuff on there and i see nathan leaf lights saw wrr channel nine yes and pix channel 11 those are the monster providers we all had our uh, our our gateway uh, who are the gateway people for you it sounds to me reagan that nathan was your gateway person but nathan who is yours mm-hmm. who's the person who guided you into the the nastiness i like I said earlier, I did not really become a movie fanatic until probably high school. My, that's, my first job was at a movie theater. I worked at a little place called RC Theaters, and it got bought out by Regal Cinemas. Um, <laughs> this was like the mid-90s, so I think 96 is when I first started, and that's when mm-hmm. I really started getting into films. I just, I, I always liked movies, um, but I just didn't know, I just didn't, especially back then, I just didn't know what, past Entertainment Weekly, I didn't know what was out there outside of the TV yeah. guy, HBO. And then I started getting into, you know, oh my God, Fargo. Like, Fargo came to our theater after it won all the awards. And I was mm. like, holy shit, this movie's really fucking good. Like, I've never seen a movie like this before. Where can I find more? And that's how I would be introduced is I would, you know, see, I would see like a Japanese film or I would see a French film and I'd be like, oh my God, these, you know, people would make fun of those films. But when I, when I was, you know, you know, back in the 90s, people would make fun of that stuff, mainstream to be like, why would you want to go see a French film? It's got, we have to read it. Like, why would you do that? <laughs> right. But then, I, you know, you, you go see, uh, you know, Life is Beautiful or Amelie. And I'm like, these movies make me feel feelings. Like, I want to see yeah. more, you know? I feel and things. so uh, gradually, I would get, I finally got to the point where I was in the army. And I, was, I was in South Korea and I had nothing to do. And hmm. I'm single. I've got disposable income. So I would rent like five movies you know, a day, I'd watch five movies a day. And on the weekends, I'd probably watch, you know, 15 of them. And I would just yeah. devour films, Asian cinema, French cinema, everything, or new and old. And basically, I was my own gateway. I would just search out things and find things for myself. And I would watch literally everything that came out. And by process of elimination, I would put together my list of, you know, favorite films. And it was just basically that. I would just hungry to search for new things everywhere. I would, I would rent every Asian film at Blockbuster. I would go to a mom and pop mm-hmm. shop and rent all of their, you know, older classic films, their 70s films. You know, I, I'd had, it was on a first name basis in all those places and they would recommend <laughs> stuff for me. So, and I was one of the first adopters of Netflix too. When they would, when, when they were sending out the DVDs, I would you know, yeah. I'd get like five at a time and I would watch them all and send them back and get more. And I was just a voracious, movie watcher and uh that's just basically how i did it i just self-taught just like how i'm a self-taught screenwriter too i just i was just hungry to know hungry to learn so i did it myself yeah i mm-hmm. uh, i was in the air force myself as a firefighter and i i uh brought 
uh, pink flamingos to my fire station. That made me very, very popular. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think uh, we, we all have this hunger once we get the taste uh, and cinema. Uh, it's the it's cinema itself, and then there's the 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 extra topping of the the uh, piece that gets us, the genre that gets us, that uh, seems to be made for us and talks to us. And to me, that was horror. And it sounds to me that the folks who are in there here today uh, also feel that way. And we're going to have to see about rolling, uh, winding it up, folks. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, I do want to make sure that we can tech issues get more to this. Now we have tech issues. I'm I'm sitting here. I'm barely able to pay attention trying to figure out what's going on here because I'm losing yeah. you. I'm not hearing you and I'm not uh, sure if you guys are hearing me at all. So we um, can hear you, but I yeah, get it. Let's, uh, let's, and it looks like some people want to come back for a part two. So Reagan and Nathan, if you are willing to, to, to do, uh, you know, the Hellbent takeover two electric boogaloo, I say we get it scheduled and do it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do, do it. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm ever doing Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. I I'm, love it. I'm, believe me, we'll make sure I'll, I'll see about plugging in. Uh, I think maybe this room is just giving me some shit, but uh, we'll make sure that. Uh, demons. Yes, it's demons again. They always, as soon as I say that they don't exist, they get me. But uh, I, I, we'll see about coming up with a day that works. And uh, I'm overjoyed to have you folks on again. It's been a pleasure getting to speak with you. Uh, I can't wait to hear and pick your brains a little bit more about this stuff. Uh, and to everybody that's listening also, thank you so much for the great insightful comments. Uh, when we have our part two, we'll see about having you come on in and, and throw the, the tether ball around a little bit. We'll hacky sack. We'll do a mental hacky sack with you. And uh, until next time, thanks everybody and stay hell bent. <laughs>